Okay, guys, this is it. Last video of the year. That's exciting. Um, it's been a pleasure teaching you all this year. I will see you next year. I know this year wasn't kind of what we thought it was going to be. I had like two thirds uh, the school year in the classroom, and then the last third was a, a little different. But um, hopefully, everything goes back to normal next year, and I will see you guys all back. Uh, not in my classroom anymore, but pretty much mostly you, most of you across the hall. So I'll get to see you again. Don't worry. It's not goodbye or anything like that. But anyway, um, last video, I'll try to make it short. Won't be, you know, incredibly long. Um, but we're going to talk about how species form, and this will be it for evolution. So new vocab word, speciation. This is the formation of new species. So they're going to look... Uh, similar to the common ancestors, but something is going to be different. And there was a need for that change. Uh, maybe the environment changed or, or something else, but that's what speciation is. So the rise of, of new species, kind of like how one time humans, we, you, you know, we rose. Um, and again, guys, we didn't come, you know, from monkeys. Okay. We had a common ancestor with monkeys, but that uh, node in the evolution tree is actually speciation right there. Here's another example, guys. So we have a common ancestor to all these uh, cats, and you guys can see all these cats are genetically different. They have something different about them, and that was all for a particular need depending on where they lived. Another thing here, if you look at Mr. Potato Head, uh, I kind of set up a tree for you guys here, but okay, we got this original Mr. Potato Head, and obviously he had some kind of need. Now, he doesn't have a mouth, this one down at the bottom here. He doesn't have a mouth, doesn't have eyes, as he has nothing, okay? But then we started to produce new species of Mr. Potato Heads. Now, this, I know it didn't really happen in real life, but uh, if you look at the Mr. Potato Heads above, okay, the first one, he doesn't have a mouth, all right? So he's probably going to go extinct. Uh, the second one still, you know, no, no mouth that we can see at least. He's going to go extinct. The third one, he, he may be all right. Fourth one, again, he can't get food, so he's going to go extinct. So you can see, guys, sometimes with speciation, uh, even though a bunch of new ones are going to come about, maybe they won't all stay in existence. Maybe some of them will be extinct uh, shortly after they're created. And the same thing happened with all these birds, guys. We talked about Darwin's finches. Now, we had a bunch of these finches on all of the islands, but some of the finches, they couldn't get food. So, yeah, they were all there, but some of them either flew to a different island, or if they didn't fly, they didn't have food, so they you know, went extinct on that island. So there's two different species concepts, guys. There's the morphological one, and we'll go over the second one later. Whoops. Um, so the morphological one, it's just describing a species based on its appearance, its structure. So in other words, you're looking at two different organisms and you're saying, hey, are they part of the same species? Or are they part of a different species just on how they look? You know, obviously if you have like two butterflies, you can see, okay, this one's brown, this one's brown. They look pretty similar. I'm gonna put them in the same species. If you have one that's brown and one that's blue, it's like, oh, they look a little different. Maybe they'll be different species. That's all the morphological species concept is. So here's the butterflies I talked about, but here's a bunch of different other organisms. All right? You can see the butterflies above are, they're pretty common with the, the type of uh, color they have. So we would say, okay, they're probably all in the same species. All right, the ladybugs down here, yeah, they have a different number of spots, but they look fairly similar. Um, so they're probably all in the same species. Now these ones here, it's like, okay, they're a completely different color. They might be in the same species, they might not, we're not really sure. But you could see how, it, you know, the morphological one maybe isn't the best way of grouping these organisms into different species because we're just looking at their appearance. So scientists began putting all these different organisms in and then they realized, okay, we put these organisms in different species, but then these species are reproducing. And if you guys remember from chapter one, um, the beginning of the year, that only organisms in the same species can reproduce and make fertile offspring. And I know there's some variation to that, but for the most part, that's how it is. So the scientists said, hey, you know, I got these species, they're reproducing, you know, what are we gonna do? We made an oops, okay? 
So then they came about with the biological species concept, all right? And this was a little bit better because then they, what they did was they said, okay, if they can produce fertile offspring, then they're members of the same species, all right? But if they can't, then they're probably different species. Only problem with this one is that it doesn't include asexual reproducing organisms because if they can reproduce by themselves, it doesn't really matter if they can produce fertile offspring, we know they're going to. All right, it doesn't really um, you know, chime in with that. So that's the biological species concept. It based it on if they can reproduce, okay? And if they can reproduce, they're part of the same species. I think this one's a little bit better than the morphological because the morphological, morphological one is just guessing. It's like, hey, these look similar. You know, it doesn't have to deal with reproducing at all. If you guys remember the lagger um, from, I guess, chapter one again, um, the problem with this one is, okay, we got this species and it can't really reproduce. So is it really a species to begin with? And really it's, it's not, it's like a genetic hybrid. We call these hybrid animals. So they don't really correspond too well with these species concepts. All right. So now we're going to talk about how organisms become, um, different and how they go through speciation. So there's two different types of isolation. We're going to talk about geographic isolation. This one's really easy. All it is is we got some kind of barrier. The organisms on each side of this barrier can't get to one another and they can't reproduce. If they can't reproduce, then over time, one group of uh, species is going to change, go through mutations, what have you, a little bit different than the other group. The other group will go through different mutations. So over time, these two different groups are going to look different and different and different compared to the other one. This will um, lead to divergent evolution in the end, okay? So again, guys, geographic isolation, something separates the two different, um, they're the, the same species, and over time, they're gonna come, become two different species. Here is some little chipmunks, and there's the Grand Canyon in the middle. This actually did happen. Um, they were able to reproduce, everything was fine, and then the, the canyon got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and as it got bigger, well, they became separated, the two different, or the same species, they became separated, and over time, they became completely different species. Here's pupfish, and pupfish, they live in all different types of ponds, and over time, uh, at the beginning, guys, they were all the same. And then over time, because they lived in different ponds, they became more different, more different, more different. And then they were all their own same species. All right. So there are two different types of speciation. Uh, we have geographic isolation. That was what we talked about. And when we have two new species based on geographic isolation, that is called allopatric speciation. Okay, so we have geographic isolation. Okay, and with geographic isolation, the species is separated. Now, once those two species become their own species, we call that allopatric speciation, all right? And then at the bottom there, it says, no more gene flow can exist between the two populations because now they're pretty much completely different species. Okay, so what to remember for this, guys, is geographic isolation leads to allopatric speciation, again, Geographic isolation leads to allopatric speciation. All right, here's a little chart with all that, guys. We're not going to worry about that. All right, the second one is called reproductive isolation. And what this is is when barriers exist, the organisms could be together, but for some reason, they can't reproduce, okay? It might be they're not able to mate, or even after mating, something goes wrong. So prezygotic isolation, um, this is when no fertilization can occur. In other words, you know, we might have uh, mating occur, but there's not gonna be any zygote or any baby being formed. We can also have postzygotic, meaning, okay, we get a little embryo, the baby starts to form, but even after the baby forming, uh, it's not going to be a viable offspring, okay? So this is reproductive isolation, and this is when the species are starting to get further apart from one another. So if you see these two frogs here, um, this is reproductive isolation. Their mating sites are different. The one frog's like over there, oh, you know, 
I'd like to mate, but the other frog's like, no, our mating things are different. I'm sorry, I, I can't do it. I can't be in that area, okay? That is reproductive isolation. In the end, reproductive isolation, if you remember our three selection curves from the previous video, uh, reproductive isolation is going to lead to disruptive uh, selection, meaning it's going to favor the two extremes. So we're gonna have a lot of differences between the two species. Uh, over time, after a while. Okay, so here's two different frogs. Can they reproduce? Yes, they can, okay? The problem is um, the two frogs reproduce at different times of the year. The wood frogs uh, down below here, they reproduce in late March, and the leopard frogs breed in late April. Okay, not a big deal, you would think, but because of those different times of the year, they can't reproduce together, all right? So that's another reproductive thing. Now that's gonna be a prezygotic one, okay? Because they can't even mate because of their different times of year for breeding. The liger here, this is more of a postzygotic one because the liger can form, no problem there, but the liger can't reproduce. So it can't produce um, fertile offspring. So that's still reproductive isolation, but that's post-zygotic instead of like the frogs before that's pre-zygotic. All right, so reproductive isolation leads to a different type of speciation called sympatric. So geographic isolation, that was our first one, um, that led to allopatric speciation. And our second one, reproductive isolation, leads to sympatric speciation, okay? So that's due to uh, reproductive isolation, not geographic like the first one, all right? Okay, so here's all our birds here, okay? Um, I know at the beginning, guys, all these finches, Darwin's finches, they were all um, able to reproduce with one another whenever they were like not quite all their different species. But now, because they're so different and time has gone on for so long, they can't reproduce with one another. And here's the same thing as last time, guys, just with the uh, sympatric speciation, just like the allopatric chart. We don't have to go over that. Okay, there's two different types of speciation with respect to time. There's gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. Let me show you pictures of these guys. It's a lot easier to show you through the pictures. So here is gradualism. If you see the butterfly at the beginning here, that butterfly is slowly changing over time, okay? It gets a little, on this, the downward one, it gets a little darker, a little darker, a little darker. The top one gets a little lighter, a little lighter, a little lighter, okay? Um, that's gradualism, meaning in order for speciation to occur, it happens very slowly over time, and it's very gradual, okay? Now, punctuated equilibrium, what this is, is we have our original butterfly here, it might stay the same. Sorry guys, cats are running if you hear her in the background. Um, what are you doing? So we have the original butterfly here. It might stay the same, but we might also have new species um, on each side. And it happens very quick. It's like from one generation right to the next, okay? So one of these is gonna be right, one of these is gonna be wrong. We have gradualism, you know, over time, and we have punctuated equilibrium, which is very quick. Uh, there's a need for this change, and it just happens based on that need, okay? So which one's white, right, which one is wrong, okay? Actually, uh, punctuated equilibrium is how it normally occurs, sorry guys, um, is how it normally occurs in the natural world, okay, through evolution. Are you guys gonna see this? Probably not, because there's not a need for humans to really change like that in other organisms right now. Uh, they've been changing for, for you know millions of years, but overall, the, the speciation happens through punctuated equilibrium and not gradualism. All right, guys, um, that's it for me. Uh, have a good summer, and I'll see you next year.